simulating the ocean is hard. Um, simulating a face is harder. And the reason for that is because our facial expression is used to communicate even subtle ones. And um, in 1970, a roboticist in Japan wrote about this behavior called the uncanny valley. And his, he was working on prosthetics and, and robotics, and his observation and described in his thesis was that as we improve and increase the realism of robots, we become more familiar with them as they become more humanoid and more human-like in the way they look and the way they move. However, at some point, at some point, it gets sufficiently real, it falls off a cliff, and it gets creepy. At some point, it gets creepy. Now, I've, I've shown a few examples here um, of, some of some of my favorite movies. And, and of course, um, uh, Bumblebee in Transformers doesn't resemble any human. And so it, it doesn't affect us. We're, fam we're familiar with him. He's fine. Um, Sonny in iRobot, fantastic movie, uh, is fine too because his whole body is metallic. He looks a little bit human, humanoid. He looks a little bit like human. He has human facial expressions, but you can tell they're not trying to emulate a human. And then, of course, Tintin and uh, Captain Haddock, they came right on that line. Would you guys say? They came right close to the line. It was beautiful. It was wonderful to watch, but they came right to the cliff of creepiness. And then Angelina and Jolene went right over it. This is, uh, she was um, the mother of uh, uh, Grendel, and um, she is, she is a, a monster, and uh, uh, the entire performance was, was just creepy beyond belief. And, um, uh, and that is a perfect illustration of the uncanny valley. Well, the reason, of course, is that we understand what humans look like. We see them all the time. And so our eyes are so acute, we pick on the subtlest of details. Now, we've been working on uh, rendering faces for some time. You've seen us ever since GeForce 256. We try it every single generation because this is an endeavor worthwhile. Although it's difficult, this is an endeavor worthwhile. And it's the benefits, I'll explain in a second, if I can convey to you, if I can impress you with uh, the upcoming demonstration. But before we show you um, what the new technology will do, um, let me show you what what we did just recently. This is, um, this is Don. Don is a fairy. Um, Don is um, beautifully rendered. Hair is beautiful. This is Kepler Don. It took us nearly 20 years to be able to create what appears to be uh, a fairy uh, beautifully animated. The thing that's really cool about Don is, is um, her skin, her skin and her hair. Uh, the way that the human skin works, it doesn't just bounce light. Light actually permeates through our skin, scatters underneath our skin, and then comes bouncing out in a whole lot of different directions. That creates that, that kind of lifelike look instead of plaster or just brown paint. Um, she's really, really quite beautiful. The thing that, and it was a, Dawn is a breakthrough in a lot of ways. The depth of field effects that you see that create the cinematic look in this, in this, uh, in this particular shot, the soft shadows, Look at her pores, the bump, the bump maps, the light maps, the specular maps, all of this technology that was necessary to produce Don. Um, but let's, let's uh, Don, uh, if we could have Don do a performance, please. And this is where the challenge of computer graphics comes. And in fact, this uh, roboticist in Japan, Masahiro, uh, observed that that um, uh, the uncanny can the uncanny valley is much deeper and has a much greater cliff when a particular object is in motion. And you can see how how in fact earlier she was beautiful. And now you can tell obviously that she is uh, computer animated. She's still a, a wonderfully beautifully rendered computer. Um, animation, but it's an animation nonetheless. A little bit creepy. Okay, thank you. Now let's just hold there for just a second, Curtis. Let's hold there for just a second. Um, before I show you the next one, let me tell you how it's done. 
Uh, the way that, the, if we could just turn on the light for just a second. Let me tell you how it's done. Um, it's a partnership between us and Paul, Deve Paul Debevic's USC ICT lab. It's the Institute of Creative Technologies down at the University of Southern California. They invented this performance capture technology called a light stage. You literally walk into a sphere, it's a room-sized sphere, surrounded by a whole bunch of cameras, about 156 cameras. Each one of the cameras are lit by white LED lights so that you can simultaneously light every single direction at the same time. It also has cameras that are polarized and properly filtered so that it could take all kinds of different types of, extract different types of information from that scene. You walk into this thing, and the first thing that it does is it extract the course geometry. It takes a whole bunch of pictures, and, it, and from that extracts the 3D geometry. It also takes a whole bunch of light field information so that it can extract the subtle, the subtle geometries, like your pores, like your wrinkles, and so on and so forth. Now here comes the miracle. That's just the three-dimensional geometry. The thing that, that happens after that is they then turn all of these into video. And using video cameras, they capture the video in the sphere of someone performing various expressions, about 30 expressions. Now, that's, that's easy to do. That part is easy to do. The mathematical part is to figure out how to take all of those videos of 30 different expressions, sad, happy, confused, intense, concentration, you name it to take those 30 expressions and extract from it the smallest library of mosaics that represent how you move, how you express. They, ex they extract from all of this incredible amounts of video and incredible amounts of cam camera work that was done into 32 gigabytes, about one and a half Blu-ray DVDs worth of digital content that programmatically, that programmatically allows you to replay almost any expression. Okay? Now, of course, 32 gigabytes is still too much for us to perform in real time. And so our team created a new technology called FaceWorks. The last thing was called WaveWorks. This is called FaceWorks. FaceWorks takes this 32 gigabytes of information and condenses and compresses it even further to about 400 megabytes. And what's left are three-dimensional meshes that we articulate using our GPU. These meshes are articulated using the GPU. The meshes are, are being synthesized and created in real time, tessellated in real time. And we take the light maps and the bump maps and the texture maps, we compress all of it into a new way of rendering facial expression. FaceWorks is really a breakthrough piece of work. And, um, well, let's show it to you. This is uh, Digital IRA. IRA is not a recording. IRA is being processed in real time on a, GP, on a GPU called the Titan. Just uh, mathematically, it takes about 8,000 instructions, an 8,000 instruction long program to articulate the geometry, all of the mes meshes, and all of the pixel processing necessary for each and every pixel. Each one, the 8,000 instructions, call it five floating point operations per instruction, 40,000 ops per pixel, multiply that by call it half the screen of HD and multiply that by 60 hertz and you get something along the lines of about two teraflops, which is about half of the performance necessary by Titan, which is one of the reasons why we built Titan, so that we can do things like this. Now, of course, the lighting is, is wonderful. You can see the, the subtleties of the pores. Look at the way the shadow rolls over them his eyes. Now imagine, imagine each and every one of us would have one of these scans done. And I, I frankly think that every important 
person on earth that I have it done. Could you imagine if Lincoln had this done? And we could literally sit there and talk to him and listen to him talk and give that speech um, in, in a fidelity like this. Um, what would it be like if we could use this for telepresence? So instead of video conferencing, our words are translated into instructions which would express or animate the avatar on the other end. We can talk to you from just about any angle. You can move around and look around. Now let's make, let's make Ira say a few things just to... So Ira, what did you have for breakfast? I ordered a yogurt parfait and the whole parfait was fruit, frozen fruit. There is no yogurt. It's supposed to be half fruit and half yogurt, but the whole thing is frozen fruit. <laughs> That's pretty amazing, huh? That's really amazing. Hey, let, let me ask you something. Have you heard of Shield? What do you think about Shield? Take my money! <laughs> All right, let's make, let's make, um, well, let's see, what can I make you do? Hey, show me Zoolander. That's not bad. Okay. Show me um, white guy dancing. <laughs> Only all the Asians laughed. <laughs> Only all the Asians laughed. Okay, you guys, that's great. That's digital IR, you guys. Let's put our hands together for the team. Good job, you guys. <laughs> and all of that was running on Titan. Okay, so that's face work, advanced real-time character performance. Uh, imagine, imagine how, uh, how um, real-time performances, video games or video conferencing, avatars could really be revolutionized as a result of some technology like that. So that's the first part, chapter one, computer graphics.